uh, I think uh, last week I, I didn't start it till we were like a third of the way in, uh, but that's what happens. Great to have you all with us. Happy Monday. Um, I'm going to uh, start. Um, we're just going to, huh, that's interesting. All right, we're going to uh, start with uh, our normal slideshow, but and then I'll introduce our guest uh, to you as well. So, um, so we're really psyched to be talking about day employment services today. Um, always a good topic. Um, Want to just remind you, we do not only these webinars, but also um, other webinars and other outreach through your support. So, and our goal is to get community sports and services that foster self-inclusion, self-determination, and equity across all aspects of society. And, I, and this is uh, week two of the conference committee that's meeting. And I want to encourage you all, even though we have some disappointments about what, what's available and how much funding's available, um, it's, it's still, it's a big year in terms of trying to get the maximum possible for services. And I just want to encourage you to take a look um, and at our list and, uh, you know, help, help get your legislators supporting it. And then um, before we end today, we'll share a little bit about um, what's coming up um, from Carrie's side. If she's got other um, webinars this month, I know it's been a busy uh, month so far from May into June. So really psyched about all we were able to do. So let me introduce Kathleen. It's the first time I met her. So she's the statewide director of day and employment services for the, uh, can you all see that, the slides? No. No. Well, okay. That's really interesting. Okay. Wow. Actually, right. actually Leo, we couldn't, we didn't see your slides at all. Well, either. I figured once you said you couldn't see it, yeah, that you weren't seeing. Uh, that's wild. Okay. My screen. So that explains Isn't that interesting. Okay. Um, so Kathleen, it's a pleasure to meet you today. And a lot of people might be meeting you for the first time. Um, she uh, was director of employment and family services in Maryland, Maryland's Development Disabilities Administration. And her foundational knowledge was from a role as a coordinator, coordinator of community services for the Wacomico, I should have asked you how to say that, Wacomico County yes, Health Wicomico. Department. Okay. <laughs> and you know, in certain states like Ohio and Maryland, there's services are in Pennsylvania, uh, services are delivered through counties. And of course in Massachusetts, our county services are a little different. I guess we've got jails, you know, are, are part of it. There used to be health entities that were part of counties. I don't think so, so much anymore. <clears throat> but county infrastructure is very different in Massachusetts. It's very um, either state driven or town um, and city driven. Um, but as a graduate, she's a graduate of the National Leadership Institute at on developmental disabilities at the University of Delaware. And um, some examples of her work include promoting employment first principles in policy, person-centered approaches to plans by using the life course framework. And she actually is a life course ambassador. So we're thrilled about that. And uh, that's great. And she advances, she's advanced the CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Community Settings Final Rule. And our, our states actually still hasn't given its final draft. Um, and they have to get it in because by March of 2023, uh, I think it's the deadline to get approval for that. So Kathleen, welcome. Um, really looking forward to have, having you meet with people and talk with people. And let me pull up. Uh, Thank you so much, Leo. It's really a pleasure to be here and it's very nice to virtually meet everyone. Um, and just so, um, also a coordinator of community service is the same title as a service coordinator here. So just so that uh, it's usually in different states, it's called different things, but I wanted to make sure that, um, you know, the audience knows that uh, I also was on the field working with people and families and brokering services as well. Um, so thank you so much, Leo and Carrie and the ARC um, for having me here today. I'm gonna just go over um, day and employment services and kind of what the next uh, year work plan is really looking like, what we're focusing on. Um, 
And so, uh, Leo, I'll say next slide, I guess, every time. Um, so this is perfect. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that we always start by looking at a trajectory. Um, this is based off of charting a life course framework, which is a framework and a lens and a tool to really support the good life for all people. And what I mean by that is that all people have the right to live, love, work, and play and be active members in their community. And charting a life course framework, for those that know, um, was developed out of University of Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, through their institute. Institute of Human Development and um, many uh, state disability administrations and organizations, people, uh, self-advocates, family members utilize this framework as a tool to help with person-centered planning so that a person can achieve their good life. Um, so with Day and Employment Services, what we really want to look at is what we want more person-centered supports and services. We want community membership and inclusion uh, we want employment first, which doesn't mean employment um, only. It means that employment is an option for someone who wants to seek employment or a work-based learning opportunity, and that we provide the supports and services for them to meet their um, intended goal. We want to build capacity within um, our network. We want to be able to support families. And we also want quality of our um, outcomes. So, you know, we're really looking at um, are our services and supports effective? Are we communi utilizing community mapping to really make sure that a person is supported towards their good life? And then seamless transition throughout people's lifespans. You know, transition doesn't just happen when somebody exits school um, through the turning 22 age group. It, a transition is through any of your life experiences, whether it's aging or, um, you know, in, in early development and childhood. So we really want to be able to support that seamless transition and meet people's needs. What we don't really want, right, is lack of choice and isolation and segregation. We don't want restrictions that are unintendedly placed on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and we also want we want high expectations, not low expectations for all people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We don't want unemployment and we definitely don't want eligibility support only lives, meaning that we want people to be part of their community as they see fit and as resources develop throughout their entire lifespan. So with that, that's kind of our mission and our core values and principles that are supported through the Charting a Life course framework. Next slide, please. So when I came to Massachusetts, I'm still in a bit of a learning process, as Leo mentioned before. Um, different states are structured differently. And um, when I came to Massachusetts, I learned a lot originally about what kind of supported employment services we provide and community-based day supports. And um, we, ident we identified that I think that we wanted to provide a two-page universal design that we're currently working on um, to provide guidance on what exactly those services and supports are, what is their intended outcome for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities so that people, families, um, day and employment service providers, service coordinators, or any stakeholder that really interacts with our supports and services has a general understanding and a universal guidance to uh, refer to in the planning process. Um, we want to be able to utilize charting the life course as a lens. Um, so we want to include the principles and values that I um, explained earlier, which talks about the right for everyone to live, love, work, and play in their community. Um, the structure of this will um, encompass the DDS um, supports and services. So that's individual supported employment, group supported employment, and community-based day services. Um, it is also very essential when you um, develop two-page guidance universally through national best practices to have different levels of stakeholder input and development, not just feedback. So input means that they're at the table when you're developing the guidance. So currently we've been partnering with ADP um, to uh, 
with our providers of day and employment services to uh, through a work group process to look at these two page documents and provide input. And we are also going to be utilizing our Chartering the Life Course ambassadors here in Massachusetts, which we have quite a bit of um, ambassador buy-in. And we're really excited and proud to be able to develop work groups that include self-advocates that have our Chartering the Life Course ambassadors and family members. So they will be part of this input process in the development and strategy to also um, communicate these universal documents. They will be part of that uh, strategic um, work plan. And right now we're still in the development stage. Um, however, we're hoping for a fall 2020 uh, launch uh, for the day and employment uh, universal guidance. So that's something that we've been really targeted working on since I started about six months ago. Next slide. All right, we also um, have a new model of service um, that is uh, up and coming. Uh, Community-based day services is a, is a current support and service uh, that we provide, but through a um, uh, input uh, process over the past coming years, we really were looking at promoting more of a site list or um, uh, model of support, meaning that it is slightly different um, and has a bit of different expectations than the community-based day services when it's provided in both community settings and licensed um, site settings. So the without walls model, um, this program is intended to be provided exclusively only in community settings and does not involve a use of a licensed site. And that's including as a transportation hub because a person is actually picked up directly from their, their home um, and then directly uh, transported into the community activity of where this um, support is, is taking place. So that includes um, activities such as uh, pathways to employment, it could be volunteering, um, developing relationships um, in the community. Without uh, walls may be provided um, with activities that promote opportunities for increased independence and inclusion. And this is all done through a person-centered planning process because all of these opportunities should link back directly to a person's unique um, goals and preferences and support their desired outcomes. So there's still different expectations now through this model of service that a provider of the CBDS uh, without walls model really take the time to develop an individualized schedule with a person that links directly back to that person-centered planning process. And what we're hoping is just increased in com uh, community inclusion and opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to really um, make movement on their, their trajectory of what they define as their good life. Um, next slide, please. We also, I just wanted to bring um, uh, attention to something that has consistently been provided in Massachusetts, but we have an Employment First Massachusetts website. Um, the site was developed to support the implementation of the department's Employment First policy and the blueprint for success employing individuals with intellectual disabilities in Massachusetts. And I just wanted to make sure that um, the community knows that we continue to support trainings on all of our meaningful day uh, supports and services, including employment services through this website. Um, it's, they're available for people to sign up. Um, that includes uh, day and employment providers, their, their staff, service coordinators can utilize it to also find resources. People and families can also see the resources that have been developed to support um, families and, and community mapping. It's a, it's a really great tool to utilize and to refer back to for any of the best practices in supporting employment, as well as community-based day activities. Next slide, please. 
And I'm sorry if I, I'm talking fast, but it's it's my it's uh, and I talk with my hands. I don't know if uh, anyone noticed yet, but um, it's part of my delivery, I guess. Um, our current initiatives. Um, are currently updating a, a memorandum of agreement between um, our vocational rehab, um, MRC, and DDS to that describe and support uh, dual uh, people that we provide employment services to. So with that, there's gonna be some updated information on eligibility, and we want to make sure that our staff are continually trained to support employment outcomes so that transitions um, from employment supports from MRC to DDS long-term supports happens in a more seamless fashion. Um, so we're currently updating that memorandum of agreement and that will be communicated with the stakeholders as soon as the both of the commissioners sign and we're really excited about that updated opportunity. Um, we continue to support flexibilities with employment services and use of technology to address workforce needs. Um, and with that, we're part of a community of practice with the state of Missouri that focuses specifically on the use of technology and employment. And what are the best practices and where are there innovations occurring on a national level, but also strategically on the field. So we have some of our day and employment providers that participate that talk about the specific apps or technology that they may use to support someone seeking employment or are employed and receiving um, job coaching or task analysis and such as reminders to do specific tasks via certain applications. And it's been a really wonderful partnership that we're continuing to support so that we continue to learn how to support people better with more flexible options. Um, and, we, and we utilize our services uh, with best practices. We also have expanding resources to people and families on charting the life course. Um, there's a link here that I uh, put in. It's our Employment First MA uh, website, but it's specifically about raising expectations and utilizing charting the life course as a lens uh, for person-centered planning. And again, to make sure that we're promoting people to live their good life and how, how we can utilize these tools uh, through the person-centered planning process. Um, Leo, I think it oh dropped off a little bit. <laughs> um, oh, yep. So Leo is showing us right now. We have the resources that are available to the public on here. As you can see from this website that I've mentioned earlier too, we also have guidebooks and uh, handouts that have been developed. And I just wanted to make sure that we linked that as well so that people and families, um, self-advocates can utilize these short videos to, uh, to, to really refocus kind of back on using it as a lens um, specifically. Next slide, please. And so with that, some future initiatives that I think that we are identifying as places we would like to go and, uh, and provide uh, more, more technical assistance on and best practices is really focusing on additionally expanding competency-based trainings for direct support professionals and employment direct support professionals that are assisting a person um, in all of our meaningful day services community-based aid services and employment services. Um, we know that there are national best practice trainings such as um, the ACRE trainings or the, the certificate for the CESP, which is Certified Employment Support Professional. And we would like to look at that and see if what we can develop to continue to support people, families, providers that have goals of being employed in the community and do, are they, you know, do they have access to the trainings and are we structuring our supports and services to really deliver those outcomes. Also expansion of the outcome data reporting um, for our next fiscal year. So currently, um, and for the past 18 years, um, we have worked with providers to report um, on provider reported data on employment, 
And uh, it is good baseline data for each provider to aid in organizational transformation for individual person-centered planning. And we want to drill down that data as a state progresses to the CMS final rule compliance, the Center for Medicaid Services. Um, and what we're specifically looking at is a better understanding of how people are supported when they are not working. So that would be looking at is a person's activities in community-based day services, for example, spent majority of the time in a facility-based non-work or in the community-based non-work setting, such as volunteering at a community site or any of those other activities as I've listed before. And then we also look at a better understanding of why someone isn't spending time in an integrated community setting. Is it an organizational or an individual barrier? And we can better support people if we understand that data level. Um, and it can be utilized as a tool um, through the person-centered planning process to identify providers that can provide those supports. Um, with that, also after the universal guidance is developed and output, we realize that that won't be the one all. We'll need to per continually to provide um, frequently asked questions, answers to those frequently asked questions that come up. This may be frequently asked questions from uh, a person receiving services and supports or a family member service coordination, multiple layers of stakeholders so that we make sure that we put out easy to understand and accessible guidance um, through frequently asked questions document. So that's what we're really focusing on with future initiatives in the coming year. Um, and I believe that's all that I have to talk uh, today about in my slides, but I'm sure there's questions. Um, and you can contact me at any time. My email is the best way to contact me. And I uh, really am open as far as a professional. So please feel free to ask any questions. And I really um, appreciate the time to kind of do a brief overview. I know I feel like I just talked at you for a while, but um, this is a great opportunity and I love the fact that I can uh, be here as an introduction to supporting Massachusetts. And the slides I'm reading will be available and sent to all the attendees. Hey, thank you, Kathleen. That was exciting stuff and especially these days. It's great to hear uh, someone with your background um, leading the efforts in this area. And so it's exciting. I wonder if anybody wants to either chat a question or um, go ahead and, and ask a question about, I, oh, go ahead, Kathleen. Um, thank you so much for that. That sounds really, really exciting stuff. Um, I guess as a, my son is currently in a CBDS program and we're still in a situation where they haven't gone out, been able to go back out into the community because of staffing um, issues. So there's no volunteer opportunities. There's no opportunities for group supported employment. Um, and I'm wondering, has DDS given, I know we understand the work for, work, workforce crisis is the main um, barrier to all of this. Has DDS given any thought as to how maybe we can kind of get the ball rolling so that, you know, and it, they can even just start going out into doing volunteer and, um, and ideally it'd be great to do great supported employment, but at this point, I think he'd just enjoy getting out, out of the facility for a little bit, so. Right, I really appreciate your question. Yes, it's definitely something that I think, you know, we continue to um, hear that is a concern um, that, that people are not, you know, accessing community settings as frequently as they were pre-pandemic and that the staffing crisis is definitely influencing um, the ability for people to access community settings. However, we are very committed to people receiving those type of um, access, especially with CMS final settings rule, that a person has opportunities to, um, to attend and be involved and active in their community. And through that, we've 
provided a lot of technical assistance opportunities for certain providers that might need to look at organizational transformation in order to support that out, those outcomes. Um, and additionally, we have looked at providing um, additional supports around person-centered planning opportunities or utilizing the tools to really map and make sure that um, a person's unique goals and outcomes are being supported into these community settings. And it's not just happening at a facility site, but it's definitely something that's an ongoing development. And we, we take it very seriously that people have access. Um, and so I, I encourage, you know, the providers of those, those services and supports to continue to reach out to us for technical assistance and that we continue to, um, you know, adjust and, and provide some of those flexible options, um, which includes some of that technology. But again, there's nothing that quite subsets building those relationships in the community and a provider providing those supports and opportunities. Um, and those are our expectations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Carrie? Hi, um, I just had a question that I, I'm so excited about, you know, charting the life course, you know, I'm a, an ambassador too, and um, using it because it's a very, very well designed person centered tool. Now, who do you anticipate um, providing these person centered facilitating these person centered um, conversations and planning and that sort of thing? Is it are the uh, day and employment folks going to be brought up? to understand charting life course. I'm just curious what the plan is for that. Sure, I think that's a great question, Carrie. I think that mostly what we have to do is always not just rely on one source or stakeholder to provide that person-centered planning. My background is in targeted case management or service coordination, right? And so um, making sure that our service coordinators have access to also become ambassadors or utilize Lens and um, have have the, have the resources and the tools in a person-centered planning process, for example, to develop an individual support plan is really important, but it's also important for um, not only day and employment providers, but all providers of our supports and services to have these tools. So I don't view it as just like a one, one targeted population of people that are supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's also about engaging self advocates. So it's really about, we want to, we want a 360 view and we want to make sure that people have access, regardless of their stakeholder title, um, to utilize in a person-centered planning sense. But most likely that happens in the individual support plan with different team members. Um, so with that, the ambassadors, as you know, we kind of are the person in the room sometimes that is we're the ones that are bringing the lens. And I think it's about continuing to develop that, um, that interest. And we're really seeing that in Massachusetts. I know, Carrie, we've you know, been part of many work groups where we're really seeing the tools being utilized in a multiple different capacities, whether it's even our administration or other administrations. Um, for example, public health. I mean, it's really being adapted in multiple ways. But at the core of it, charting the life course is just about it's a tool that and a lens that can be utilized for anyone, including someone with or without a disability. And it's supposed to help you live your good life. And so what we are really committed is to coming at it from multiple different ways. Um, and and that's, that's gonna be our, our kind of targeted projection in the next year or two is really engaging not only DDS staff and service coordinators, but also people and families and day and employment providers that they know this is a tool, for example, in developing their day or employment program or utilizing it through a person-centered planning process to identify activities that might match with the person's ISP, but also on the other end when we're looking at other 
other resources because it's very specific in the sense we don't want just an eligibility supports only life. You know, we want we want community engagement. We want to capture the the person's you know entire network and expand it. I was just going to uh, drill a little deeper on that in terms of the people involved, which you I think implied. Uh, or explicitly said, but just to make it easier for the people, whether they're staff listening or family members and individuals with disabilities, that really at, at the work site, despite the workforce crisis that Kathleen referenced, that the people that do work on the ISP, maybe the leads, the whatever they call them at the day and employment sites, it'd be great um, for them to be educated, right, on this program and um, trying the life course. And I think that's probably what Carrie, you were sort of noodling at, like, getting the training so people at that are touching people right in a right. daily way then the person center plans develop based with that and then the staff that implement whether they're aware of it or not are, are literally following through right with things that were developed in that way both person centered um, you know and one of the things I want to share with people and remind them we've shared it before that they can go on to um, our site and look for the tools for tomorrow booklet that utilizes charting life course so it's called you know it's at the website and you add slash tools and you can download a tools to that's and it, we got permission to use charting life course in this tools so you can go into your employment or day program and say hey you know or even day have by the way which is not managed by dds right which a lot of people go to and and you can go ahead and and ask for that, you know, and and so you can advocate to make it happen. I think everyone needs to work together, right, to make it happen, or else, you know, it'll be very slow given the workforce situation. And that might also motivate people to be more creative. I also want to recommend that. I don't know how open agencies are. The next time I meet with some leaders of agencies, I'll ask them, you know, if they're inviting families and individuals with disabilities to give them input on this crisis. Um, I don't want to, I, I was going to end with this statement, but we can also make a difference on that. And, and basically right now, the benchmark for salaries is $16.79 an hour, and it's for the direct support end of it. So that means if you've been there four years or one year, that's the median that they pay, which means some people are getting paid less than that, since usually the dollars are 70% of the contracts. So we will have a bill out um, revised for just our field. That includes DDS and rehabilitation, and so I'm going to encourage everybody to get on board and we use that as a flag to help move ahead, um, get us out of this, you know, standstill post-COVID period that's pretty much about workforce, not so much about COVID anymore, right? Um, any other questions for Kathleen in terms of the great presentation? And, you know, I, I think you have to move with values, Kathleen, right, regardless of what are the challenges we face or else we'll never move ahead. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, part of it is like the values and the principles don't change, you know, regardless of, of our environment. And so what we're here to do is just commit to that and continue to be flexible and continue to support as much as possible. So I just really wanted to make sure that our focus was bringing those core principles and values to the forefront and really why we do what we do. Um, and it's been really wonderful to be uh, working with everyone from people and families receiving supports and services to the day and employment providers so far. It's been a, honestly a very collaborative effort and I really appreciate it. Great. Any last questions? We'll, we can end a little early. Nothing wrong with that. All right, everybody. I'm wondering if, uh, oh. Charles, did you have, uh, you unmuted yourself. So I just was wondering if you had a question. Yes, I did. I was I was waiting for uh, Leo to finish up. Um, Kathleen, I'm Charlie Powderly. I'm with the Metro West Employment Collaborative. We're part of uh, Riverside's Employment Collaboratives. I'm sure you're familiar with Don Hughes and Stephanie Marks and so on and so forth, Cindy Thomas. Um, the reason I wanted to mention that is that um, we obviously touch a number of provider agencies and a large number of job developers. So as you're uh, beginning to roll all of this information out to the provider agencies, we'd be more than glad to facilitate that, post this information on our Basecamp uh, web portal uh, and help just drive this out into the community because it's, it's extremely important. 
Yes, thank you so much. I think that's fantastic. I am actually meeting with Cindy later today on uh, the regional employment collaboratives and the work that you do is fantastic. So we will definitely be utilizing you in every opportunity to communicate all of the essential information. So I really appreciate that. Excellent. Charlie, Ch Charlie, do you want to describe the collaboratives really quick for people? Just, just oh, yeah. you know, just that might be great because I don't think we haven't talked about it in months. So sure, sure, be glad to. Um, so Riverside Community Care, Human Service Agency, headquartered out of Dedham. Uh, one of the um, uh, services that we provide, obviously, is employment services. More particularly with the regional employment collaboratives, there are six employment collaboratives across the state. We cover most of the state. Uh, we're contracting currently for some expansion of that, but uh, we'll hold that surprise for later on. Um, so there are uh, six regions, one of which is uh, facilitated through ICI. David Urban handles the South Shore Collaborative. We have the Northeast, the Greater Boston, the uh, South Shore with David Urban, uh, the Metro West area, which I am the project coordinator for. We have Central Mass and we have Western Mass. Our job as project coordinators is to be out in the community forming relationships with uh, major corporations, understanding what their job needs are, we then push that information out to our job developer network. And, and again, each of the collaboratives has probably uh, 40 to 50 job developers and provider agencies connected to it. We push that information out to them. They then uh, provide us with clients that want to apply for those positions. We help push their credentials into the HR context that we have and make sure that they're taking a look at those credentials too. Uh, interview the candidates and hopefully potentially ultimately offer them a job. Okay, uh, so that's our role. So I spend a lot of my time out in the community working with employers, but then feeding that information back to the job developers and work that loop of trying to get uh, individuals, people with disabilities employed out in the community. Again, increasing independence, increasing their inclusion in the community. So there's a nutshell of, of, of what we do. Thank you, Charlie. Charles, Absolutely, thank it. you. All right, I think we're good. I uh, want to wish everybody a great week. Kathleen, thank you so much. Thank you, Leo. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. And I'm always very supportive of the ARC. So it's really great to have such a great collaboration. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate right. it. All right, everybody have a great great week and we'll see you we're not going to be on next week because of Juneteenth but we'll be back on the 27th celebrating um, for families and staff and individuals who want to learn what it feels like when you turn 50 and some of the things you look back on you look ahead to we're going to have a, a video a few minutes of Reggie Malloran who turned 50 this year he's a gentleman with autism and happens to be um, Haitian American and his parents will talk about the things leading up to and looking ahead for the future. And it's just a good way, I thought, for younger families to get a sense of you know, what lies ahead. So um, hope everybody has a great week. See you in a few weeks uh, on Leo Live. Take care, bye-bye.